Hey, this is Dan Wonderlich from Defining Grace, and welcome to Art of the Sermon, a show for preachers, teachers, and communicators. This is part two of a two-part conversation with Bishop Ken Carter. Bishop Carter leads the Florida Conference of the United Methodist Church, and he's also the president-elect of the Council of Bishops. If you haven't done so already, I would encourage you to go back and listen to part one of our conversation as we learn all about Bishop Carter, his career, and his approach to preaching. But then our conversation shifted as I asked Bishop Carter about the conflict currently going on in the United Methodist Church. He spoke passionately about the role that preaching can play in finding unity during seasons of conflict. And as I was planning out episodes and looking at the calendar, I noticed that this one would come out two and a half weeks before the U.S. presidential election. So I decided to cut the interview in two so we could highlight this part, because even if you're not a United Methodist or have any interest in denominational politics, we live during a season of polarization and conflict, especially right now. And I feel like his words are very powerful. He also went on to speak very hopefully about the future of the church and the powerful tool that preaching can be even if it needs to shift and change. You talked about the challenge of of unity and conflict within bodies and if anyone has been following uh, the sort of political side of the United Methodist Church we are facing many questions and challenges about our future together and I was wondering as you prepare uh, to step into that role in the Council of Bishops and may have the opportunity to to lead or at the very least preside in potentially a, a special general conference within the next couple of years how do you see the role of preaching either from you specifically or from the bishops in general as as guiding our wider denomination uh that's a great question uh dan you know it it and i would begin to answer it um by an assumption i have and that is that the person who is the preacher has a great deal of power and authority and and that is found in the fact that she or he is the one who stands up in front of everyone and and speaks, and they listen. Uh, and so I would begin by saying uh, we tell stories of unity, reconciliation, overcoming divisions, and and we, we try to give people a vision of how this can happen uh, and how it does happen. Uh, and, you know, I told the story uh, at the ordination sermon of Derry Barnhart, who was a local pastor, minister of visitation in the church I served in Winston-Salem, how he uh, began to be in ministry with a person who was on death row uh, and how he ministered in a church for whom that was conflictual because this person had actually committed the murder one of their members had been charged with. Mm. Uh, and yet he, he led that church in a way that had integrity even through that division. Uh, and I think uh, it's acknowledging that we do have divisions, uh, uh, we do have conflict, any human organization does, any church does, but how can we lift up a vision of God's desire for, for a unity and a wholeness uh, that transcends all of that? You know, it's the prayer of Jesus in John 17. So I think, uh, you know, the role of the preacher uh, is... Uh, he or she is the person who gets to stand up before the community, and it matters a great deal what's, what, what you make visible and what you ignore, uh, what you, what you uh, focus on and what you shift to the margins. And so I believe that, again, the word of uh, whether it's uh, Pentecost or whether it's John 17 or whether it's the great passage in Ephesians um, Ephesians about the breaking down the dividing wall of hostility, uh, or Acts 15. There are there are places within Scripture where we we are tempted to toward our tribalism, toward our divisions, uh, and yet the Holy Spirit is always pushing us uh, toward more of that. Uh, one of the images I'm working on. We're going to have some town hall meetings in Florida in the fall. And I'm working on uh, an image of uh, all the bridges in Florida. So mm. I'm, I'm thinking of using uh, pictures of the St. John's River Bridge and the Manatee Bridge and the Seven Mile Bridge and even the bridge in, in the uh, Green Swamp area. And uh, 
and how every in Florida we all cross some bridge to get to where we're, we're going. Florida is a peninsula with lakes and rivers over which bridges go. And so I'm trying to think about that as an image for how we can build bridges with fresh expressions toward people outside the church, how we can build bridges toward children in impoverished schools, uh, and how as a denomination we can build bridges to each other. So I, so I think you just search for images and uh, for the places in Scripture that um, where, where we find this. Absolutely. And no matter what happens organizationally or politically with our denomination, obviously the universal church will remain. And even if United Methodism, you know, goes through some sort of transformation, there will always be pastors and churches and lay people that organize around John Wesley's approach to faith and theology. And I was wondering if you had any insights into how the Wesleyan approach might specifically uh, be good at reaching or might struggle to reach uh, emerging generations and populations. I, I mean, I I just love the Wesleyan the Wesleyan theology. I love the Wesleyan theology, and I would just say simply, I love uh, the idea of provenient grace uh, that that the image of God is present in every person. We never lose that image of God. That the God always has a point of contact with us, and that we are always on a journey toward holiness and perfection and wholeness, and we never arrive until shortly before our death, perhaps, but that God, God's agenda is always to keep working with us. And then the, the piece of the social holiness piece is that we need each other to, uh, to do this spiritual work. So I believe that is a message that honors the dignity of people where they are, but, but encourages us to, to be more than we are at the present. Yeah, I, th- I think that's great. And having worked in campus ministry, I know the the social gospel and the social holiness aspect is certainly attractive to younger generations. But I also think you touched on that sanctification piece. I, I think it does a good job of both encouraging younger generations because it's our admitting that we're not perfect uh, and that we don't have it all figured out. That's one of the stereotypes of the church is that we all just put on the smile and act like we're perfect. But at the same time, it is a challenge to go on to perfection and that we don't just you know sit in our broken and just say, well, whatever, I am who I am, and and nothing will ever change. There's both that encouragement and the challenge at the same time. Right, right. When you're, as you mentioned uh, multiple times, you're a huge supporter of the Fresh Expressions movement, and you have championed that here uh, in the Florida Conference. How do you see the role of preaching fitting into Fresh Expressions and new expressions of church? Are are people still willing to sit and listen to sermons, whether it's twenty minutes or you know up to an hour, or do we need to find fresh expressions for teaching and preaching as well? Uh, that's a great question, and uh, maybe maybe Dan, you can help us figure this out. <laughs> All right. <laughs> The uh, I do think uh, that there is um, there's always a need for preaching for pro- proclaiming the gospel. Uh, I think people are willing to sit and listen to a person speak. Uh, years ago, I went and heard Ira Glass uh, of This American Life. Uh, right, I heard him kind of give a concert or a lecture. Uh, and uh, you know, This American Life often will tell one story and work with it for an hour. Uh, and it's very compelling. And so I think uh, it's not the length, it's how creative we are, it's how, how it touches the human condition, how it points us toward hope. Uh, I do think that, uh, you know, there is a need for this. I've wondered, for example, in a Fresh Expressions context, uh, could you have a gathering once a month that started with uh, the stories of people's lives? And you see this happening a lot in uh in, in the media and podcast media with uh, gatherings of people who will come around a particular theme like uh, loss or uh, my first day at work or something like that. And I've wondered, could, could a fresh expressions be oriented around people bringing their stories? And I do think that we're in something of a shift from a uh, linear one person preaching down a long linear hallway to more dialogical. Does that make sense? Yes, Uh, absolutely. And, and I don't quite have that figured out and it may be that it's not my generation that figures it out, but, but I think that people, they want to hear, they want to listen and they want to be heard. 
and they want somehow their story to connect with uh, God's story. And uh, I think preaching is maybe going to become more about that. Uh, it'll be it'll be interesting to see how that emerges. We have a set of questions that we like to ask all of our guests, and the first is, what was one of the most difficult sermons for you to prepare and preach, or do you have any favorite experiences from preaching and teaching? Um, well, you know, as a pastor, I would say the most difficult sermons were always around uh, profound grief and loss in a congregation. Uh, in one church, the deaths of three teenagers in an automobile accident that, that happened on a Good Friday, the Easter Sunday morning sermon, which uh, I think it was called Poking Holes in the Darkness, and it was in the circuit rider later. And so just uh, that was the most difficult sermon, and yet people were listening. I knew that. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, so that was one of the more difficult ones. Often, you know, the, the last Sunday I've been at a church was one of the more difficult ones, uh, you know, the saying goodbye. So I would say those were the more difficult, uh, I, the favorite ones. I always loved preaching on Easter and Christmas Eve. Uh, I just loved preaching about the incarnation and I love preaching about the resurrection. So do you, do you prefer one to the other Christmas versus Easter? You know, I I don't know. I just, uh, there was something about the late Christmas Eve service that I just loved preaching about the light and then people holding up the candles. And so maybe Christmas Eve, maybe that was a favorite. Yeah. yeah. You and I had the opportunity. It wasn't just the two of us. You took a bunch of newly ordained clergy to the Holy Land this past January. Right. And right. for me, the most powerful moment was uh, our group together singing Silent Night in the Cave of the Nativity. Right. Uh, yeah, and, that, was, that was amazing. Yeah, yeah. It, just, it just plays on your on those emotions. And, and it reminded me of family and of home and of all of the churches that I've been a right. part of. Well, our right. second question is, who have been some of the most impactful preachers or non-preacher communicators in your life and why? Um, you know, and some of this is going to, uh, you know, date me. I'm uh, in my late 50s, but I would say early on, uh, there was a preacher named John Claypool, who was uh, a Southern, out of the Southern Baptist tradition, sort of a confessional preacher, uh, pastoral preacher. And I mentioned Ernest Campbell of the Riverside Church. Uh, those were both uh, extraordinary people who affected my preaching early on. William Sloan Coffin, also of the Riverside Church. Uh, so I would I would say those were uh, preachers uh, I learned a great deal from. Uh, I think I also learned a lot from uh, just reading, reading novels, reading short stories, uh, Flannery O'Connor short stories, uh, for example. So. Uh, you know, I would I would say that would be uh yeah. Well, that that tails uh, or that leads into our next question about books. Are there any books that have been influential on your approach to pastoring, preaching, or communicating? Uh, one I would mention uh, is entitled uh, "Just Say the Word" uh, by Robert Jack, who taught speech at Princeton Seminary, speech communication, uh, and it's a book about how we write out manuscripts. Uh, and there was a time in my life when I wrote out the manuscript, not like in paragraph form, like an essay, but in terms of lines, like you would actually say them in a phrase. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, and so that's more about form. But I would say uh, that book was influential in helping me to realize I was not reading an essay. I was it was more like uh theater. It was more like saying lines that needed to be said in digestible kind of phrases. So that's one. It's called Just Say the Word by Robert Jack. Uh, and then, um, you know, I would say uh, I was, you know, my preaching professor was, was Richard Lisher uh, at Duke, and he came out of the Lutheran tradition. And so he probably taught preaching from the point of view of what is the theology underneath our preaching? And so I would just simply say any good book about theology uh, has been influential because at the heart of it, it's uh, it's what God is saying through the word. It's God's gift of grace. It's God's gift of good news. Uh, and so I would, uh, you know, I would just say it's been the, the theological, you know, stream from uh, 
Wesley to to Karl Barth, uh, people who placed a high value on the word's ability to change us. And our final question, and this may be a little bit unfair to ask you as a bishop, but are there any currently active preachers uh, that you would point people towards, either within our denomination or outside of it? Hmm. You know, that's a great uh, a great question, current preachers. Uh, you know, I would say, uh, without becoming too politically partisan, I heard William Barber speak at the Democratic Convention. He is a preacher mm-hmm. in the African-American tradition, and uh, I found him to be very powerful. Uh, uh, so I would say William Barber... Um, Trying to think of current, you know, I, I don't have a very adequate answer to the current <laughs> people that I hear preaching. Um, you know, you mentioned the moth, uh, this American life. I find that because I'm typically preaching in in, in pl- context myself, I don't hear a lot of other people preach, and so what I tend to listen to is that kind of communication. Sure. But, uh, but I would say, uh, what preachers, what sermons, um, you know, again, I would say oddly enough, and I'm, this is going to fix me in terms of being, a uh, of a certain generation, but, uh, I find reading the sermons of Reinhold Niebuhr, Karl Barth, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, they were theologians, but they wrote sermons. I mean, Bart preached in the the prison in Basel every Sunday when he was a professor, and Bart's book, Deliverance to the Captives, Tillich's book, Shaking of the Foundations, uh, Bonhoeffer's collections of sermons. Uh, I find that they are they are a great way. Rowan Williams uh, has a great book of sermons, uh, Array of uh, I think it's called Array of Darkness. Uh, I like the sermons of Barbara Brown Taylor uh, and. Um, and so I think I would start there. Uh, that's not a comprehensive list. And I would say, you know, this is sort of sounds like, uh, you know, inside baseball. But within the Council of Bishops, uh, I have I have loved the sermons of Greg Palmer, uh, who's the bishop of the West Ohio Conference. Uh, I think he's a very compelling preacher. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes I get to hear someone like that preach uh, and it's very meaningful. Yeah. Lastly, if there are any listeners out there who want to get in touch and say hi or follow your work, uh, what's the best way for them to keep up with you? Well, I think, the, you know, my email is uh, simply bishop at flumc.org. Uh, on Twitter, it's just Bishop Ken Carter. That's a great way to stay in touch with each other. And, um, you know, I'd say that would be great. I'm also on Facebook. That's a bit of a different uh Uh, a different media, but probably email or Twitter are the best ways. Well, thank you so much, Bishop Carter, for being here and taking the time to be with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Dan, and thanks for your ministry. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Art of the Sermon. You can find show notes, including links to some of the things that we talked about at artofthesermon.com. As always, I would love to hear what you think about the show, and I want your input to be a part of the conversation. So you can connect with me through Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, all at username Art of the Sermon. If you'd like to support the show, I would encourage you to subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play Music, or your favorite podcast app so that new episodes are downloaded as soon as they're live. And of course, in addition to sharing the show with your friends, the best way to help us out is to leave a review in the iTunes store. This lets iTunes know that you care about the show and want other people to find it. Thank you again so much for joining me, and I'll catch you next time on Art of the Sermon.